This episode is sponsored by Milifiliziki Diamonds, a diamond sourcing, manufacturing, and custom jewelry company. Milifiliziki Diamonds, driven to manufacture diamonds and inspire jewelers. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Conversations with Khofane. I'm Khofane Medise, and today we are celebrating Women's Day. But when you watch this, it probably won't be. But either way, we should be celebrating women every single day of the year. And today we are joined by Dr. Natalie Bitoture. Bitoture, you just. Yes. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> How are you? Fantastic. We are doing the Forbes Leading Women Summit edition of the podcast, and you've been one of the panelists. So how's it been so far? And what conversation were you running as one of the panelists? Uh, it's been a great day. It's been so much fun. I love doing women's events, speaking to lots of ladies, learning different things. It's nice and dramatic inside the conference. Well dressed women. Oh my gosh! Smells amazing. Glam. Here. Lights, <laughs> sound, we got to do some dancing. It's been a fun day. Absolutely. Um, may you kind of you just briefly introduce yourself, what it is that you do and what really motivates you to get up every morning. Oh la la. Okay, so I'm Dr. Natalie Bitsiture. I'm the chief of staff of the Simba Group, which is my family's business that's based in Uganda and Kenya in East Africa. The businesses are over 30 years old and they span across different sectors, telecom, energy, hospitality, real estate, media and education. So I always like to joke, my job as chief of staff is chief of problems. So I basically <laughs> run between all the different companies and the boards and any kind of chaos. That's when they call me. If everything is going well, no one would call me and I just get to rest all day. But there's no day like that in business. Absolutely. Um, I also have a couple of startups. So I have Musana Carts where we work with street food vendors and we build solar powered street food carts and do lots of training for them in business, in marketing, in hygiene and sanitation, in customer service. Um, we have a platform for women in, East, in Africa called Hardworking Women. We have about 5,000 women in the community and we do trainings and courses and workshops and monthly meetups and it's lots about women's empowerment and mentorship and networking. Um, we also recently launched Yuketa, which is an online training platform, which is for both men and women. So it's affordable, practical courses for young Africans by African experts, showing them like practical skills for entrepreneurs in the workplace and in your personal life for your personal development. I'm also the chair of Save the Children's Africa Advisory Board, which is something I love to do. And it's an area I'm passionate about speaking about. You're so well articulated. I mean, oh. it makes sense because now you have to know a variety, a wide range of industries within the company that, that you do. So is that why you pursued your doctorate? Because you had to know so many <laughs> things and be able to justify why you're making certain decisions. Uh, it's a funny story. So I am used to living like this with the variety. People are always like, how do you do so many things? Yeah. I'm like, it's all I know. My father is exactly like this. And so I grew up watching him juggle like six industries a day all the time constantly so i just grew up like this and i actually wanted to pursue my phd in women's empowerment in africa i had started doing research about socio-economic interventions in africa but i am really busy so i hadn't even gotten around to like doing the formal application when my alma mater in the uk gave me a doctorate in innovation it's like oh well I might as well take that's it. so nice sure <laughs> so i kind of cheated but it was a really like wonderful ceremony and I used to call it like my PhD is not a real PhD and because I feel like I just got to have it. I didn't do like the grinding and the thesis and the four years. But you've been which living I was, it every day if you think about it, right? Yeah. Someone actually told me that one of the, the vice chancellor at the school is like, you're the only one who got to make a speech at the graduation. The people with the real PhDs just got to stand and move on. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's true. I'll stop saying that. It's something I'm very grateful for because yeah. it does open doors and innovation is something I'm really passionate about. And I feel like I do that in all the different things and the areas that I work in. And it's also what motivates me. I feel like with Africa, you can see the challenges every single day. There's no corner you will turn where everything is perfect and wonderful. Mm. And I guess that's true anywhere. But... Mm. There's so much potential. There's so many ideas. People are so young. The population's in every African country. It's wild. When you look at the statistics, when you walk down the streets, when you go into restaurants or malls or offices, you can see the energy. And I feel like there's so much that's possible. And that's what excites me and motivates me. 
I don't feel like I have to wake up to save the world. I feel like I'm excited to see what is possible. What can we learn today? What has been invented? What has been improved? What has been changed? And how can that be applied in different ways? So right. I find it really interesting. So it's a theme that really surrounds you, follows you, just social entrepreneurship and youth empowerment. And how have you seen social entrepreneurship or social enterprises aim towards um, positively impacting the unique challenges within Africa? I love social business because I feel like it's way more intentional. When I wanted to go do my master's in social business, my father did not want to pay for it. He's like, all business in Africa is social business. We're employing people, we're providing services. I'm like, please, this is why I need this degree. We need to do things intentionally, Mm. you know, plan things out, actually assess your foot carbon footprint, know what you're doing in the community. You know, I feel like there's so much more that's possible. And in Africa, We have so many opportunities to leapfrog things because we don't have to take the long route round. We can see what worked in other countries. Okay, we can learn from that and build our own solution in a more innovative way, Mm. in a way that's cleaner or greener or better for the community or better for the environment. There are so many examples. I love to use mobile money. In East Africa, we have mobile money. I don't think they have it here in the South of Africa. Wow. You can like (laughs) send money on your phone very easily. Yet you have MTN, so I don't get it, but... Safaricom, MTN, in East Africa, people don't really use bank accounts as much because you can't send all your money through your phone. Mm. In Kenya, you can pay your rent, your supermarket, your shops to each other. It's super handy. And in Europe, where I was going for school, you couldn't do that. It's only now that yeah. banks use banking apps and it's digital and it's instant. But Africa has been miles ahead for years. Yeah. Just because we had such a huge unbanked population, someone tested out an innovation and it just took off. I think it's a third of the Kenyan GDP is transacted on mobile money. So there's so many things that we can do even in a better way for the world once we sort of focus and get moving in those kinds of directions. Yeah. How do you, you've spoken a lot about innovation and we had a conversation earlier in which I said it may seem you know, a bit silly, but I don't think I really understand innovation because I fail to see it or recognize it. And so I'd like to understand just on the based on the Ugandan uh, demographic and landscape, how, ways in which innova- innovation has been used to empower youth and women and just have a leading voice. So when you look at Uganda's demographics, I am now in my mid-30s. No. By the time <laughs> by the time I am in my 60s, our population is expected to be 100 million people. Yo, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, we're yeah. at 40 million now. I'm like, how are we supposed to grow that fast? But yeah. Uganda is one of the fastest growing countries in the world. I think we're number three. Yeah. We are in the top five for youngest in the world. Half of our population is under the age of 15. And we are the most entrepreneurial country in the world. So we have the right ingredients We just need to cultivate a good environment because when you think about those statistics, it sounds like a big far-fetched number, right? But that practically means every year there's a million kids turning 18. Every single year. How many jobs can a government actually create? The government, the private sector, it's less than 100,000. However hard they try. So what happens to those 900,000 kids that are turning 18? They need to have jobs. They need employment. They need to create income. They need to look after themselves, their families. And when you have a population that grows that fast, I do um, a lot of talks with international universities, Africa clubs. Mm. And I'm always like, come back home. We need (laughs) you to come, to innovate, to teach, to learn, to grow, to work, to start businesses. Because if there's a million kids every year in Uganda turning 18, they all want a phone. They all need clothes. They all need food. They all need housing. They all need transport. They all need entertainment. So any sector you want to work in, it's... No matter how busy it looks right now, it's going to continue to blow up. Mm. Because, of course, with compounding things, with for population growth, our governments don't really encourage birth control, which I am very against, but that seems to be an Africa-wide problem. No matter how much the literacy rates go up, it's our fertility rates are not dropping the way it happened in other continents because of our culture and religion and different mm. things. But that basically means the 1 million 18-year-olds this year In the next five years, that's going to be 1.2 million kids. In the Mm. next 10 years, that's going to be 2 million kids every year. And that's at 18. If you think about them lower, they also need food and clothes and housing and toys and different things. And that's going to be your workforce, which is a great thing. That's what they call the demographic dividend, because that's what is going to be a big powerhouse for Africa, the labor. This is what worked for China, right? But you have to be able to harness it. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to upskill these kids to give them opportunities, to give them capital, and to cultivate an environment that breeds innovation. That's what innovation really is. It's about 
opening people's minds so that they see those connections, so mm -hmm. that they try these ideas. They're not afraid, afraid to fail. They're not worried that if this business doesn't work, my whole family won't be able to eat. You need to create a safety net like that that holds the people and encourages the innovation. Because once it works, oh my God, it works. Right. And then it's scalable. And then other countries can learn. And then millions of people benefit from it. Because we can't do things the old school way. Absolutely. It just won't work with the masses that we're dealing with. And speaking of harnessing and cultivating the environment, it really does start with the mind, which speaks on something that you spoke about earlier, which is mentorship. And so many people think of mentorship as, you know, let me hold your hand. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Mm -hmm. But you had a different approach to mentorship. So highlight what mentorship is and how we can utilize and how you utilize uh, mentorship to inspire and really cultivate that environment that you spoke about. I think that's really key, especially for women, because women tend to be softer spoken or not like me up as often. <laughs> you have such a bold voice i'm like trying to match it but i'm like i'm strange practice you have to get used to it yeah um i actually learned something really interesting a few years ago i was doing a talk for the world bank and the guy on the panel i with love me, how you said that so casually <laughs> continue and um he taught me about the rule of three so yeah. he's like you always need to be in a cycle where there's someone teaching you and you have your peers and then you have someone you're teaching. So 30%, 30%, 30%, 33, 33, 33. 33% 33, 33 of your time, your energy should be from learning from those ahead of you, those above you, learning more things, learning new things. 33% of your time, you should be with your peers, mm -hmm. like understanding what's going on, how's it going for you. And how they think, right? Exactly, because yeah. you're going through the same thing at the same time. Your mentors will be older. The path has changed. True. As much as they can guide you, it's not the same path. But your peers are on that same journey with you at the same time. Sometimes you need to cry about it together. Exactly. Or vent <laughs> to each other. Sometimes you have solutions or you can go to conferences together or buddy each other or be each other's accountability person. And then you also need to pay it forward. Mm. And it's never too soon to start that. So you also need to have a mentee, someone who you are doing that for, who do, you're holding the door open for, who you're guiding, you're sending books or you're sending articles or you have chats with once every few months, you know, so that you're also investing and nurturing. Because with that cycle, not only do you improve as a person because you're constantly learning and growing and in the teaching, you're also learning, but you're giving back, you're putting in, you're planting seeds. You don't know what your mentee will grow into or what they'll be. And, and actually, what you can do in the them. monk who sold his, his Ferrari, there's a part that says that you need to, uh, for you to fill your cup, you need to pour out, right? So Yeah. That's another and I thing. think that's a cultural thing we need to adjust. Yeah. So many people, I think, because we grow up, we're all, I think, in Africa, one or two generations away from poverty, Right. So everyone has, there's a culture of it's not enough to teach the abundance mindset that I don't need to hoard or like worry about things running out or the supermarkets won't have it or our parents grew up where now there's sugar, now there's no sugar, now there's power, there's no power. Like life was so volatile. So we all have a bit of a scarcity mindset. So I feel like in Africa, when people become successful, they're not eager to be generous. Mm. They want to first make sure I have enough for me, my family. Okay, let me start hiring my relatives. Okay, let me start paying school fees for people that I know. It's charity begins at home, I agree. But at every level of success, you have more than you need. Ooh, say that again. So you need to remember that That's what so you good. have now is what you used to pray for, as the Instagram quotes say, but pay it forward, yeah. spread it, give it with a generous heart. And it will come back to you tenfold. Absolutely. But you need to do that. I think we need to do that more. And mm -hmm. I can understand where it comes from. So I'm not blaming people, but I think you can lose it a bit more than we tend to do yeah. because we do still have fear and we do see poverty everywhere. And it's something that's sort of in your mind and you're conscious of all the time. And that's something with time we will relax and adjust and get better at. Yeah. But the faster we do it, the more people you bring into the success with you. Mm, my, my mentor, Coach David Grace, says that collaborate. People don't need to, need to understand that we are all unique and we grow for more when we collaborate as opposed to just competing. Exactly. Which is just absolutely brilliant. Something young entrepreneurs are like, I can't tell people my business idea, they'll steal it. And the thing <laughs> is, it's like... First of all, <laughs> <laughs> right? Where do I start with you? Like, what do you mean, you know? Um, I love what she's talking about, you know, talking to your peers, people who are older. And that's something I really appreciate about the Forbes Leading Women Summit is that you're in an environment with so many different women of different age groups who have different experiences. And that's something that's being cultivated now. So, you know, earlier, while well, during your panel discussion, you said that your father was mentoring you and he's, you know, pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Say hi to him. Um, and you said that you had to look into having female mentors. Now that's another position of representation. So how did you go about that? And why was that something that was so integral and part of your growth journey? 
I think I've been very blessed. My father is an entrepreneur. My mother is an entrepreneur, but they've always worked together. And so I just grew up knowing business through them. And then when I finished school and I started working properly, like formally in office places and sites and doing things, we had to move offices. I think I was 22. Mm -hmm. And my parents went on a trip. We were building a hotel, so they had to go source materials. They like to do that themselves. Go buy tiles, choose wallpapers. So they were gone for like three weeks. And they left me with this site, a construction site, that was supposed to be our new office. They're like, you need to move everyone and everything from the old office to this office by this deadline because we have a tenant moving into that office. So I had worked in real estate. I knew, you know, you're going to have to park, plan, do everything. And I was coming from the UK where things are very structured, mm -hmm. right? So I had like Gantt charts, plans, structures, systems. The trucks will come this day. We're going to move everyone out, cleaning, painting, doing this, working on the site. But it was a disaster. No one on the site respected me or listened to me. Oh, I could barely speak the language. They are making fun of me. I can hear them in the corners. Like, like my, that's what my voice sounds like, apparently. And it was just freaking me out. And I didn't know what to do. And I knew we're going to be in trouble because we have a tenant who's moving in. And I have to get this site, like, done. So now I decided, because the images we have, like, I had as a woman growing up were all men in business suits being tough and macho and scary. Yeah. So I'm like, no most. I'm going to be mean. I'm going to shout. I'm going to be tough wear these ugly, boring suits, you know, and sneakers and be serious. It helped a little, but it didn't help much. So now I started to deduct their money. I'm like, every day that you are late, you are now cutting my money. I'm going to cut your money. Oh. And they thought I was completely crazy. But of course, in other countries, you like, you get fined for things like this. Yeah. In Africa, oh my God. But I had to try all these different things I had seen and I tried to emulate OB. And my dad is not like the macho's mean type. Mm -hmm. But I was like, this is going to have to work. I have to be able to deliver. So that experience really showed me I had so much to learn. Mm. And by the time my dad got back, one of the site managers had not been working really or doing much. He was not helping me at all. And he told my dad, I refuse to work for this little girl. Like, put me in charge or I'm not going to work for you anymore. And my dad said, then you don't have to work here because she has to learn how to manage these sites and you have to learn how to respect her and she has to learn how to do this. This is her business one We day. like your dad. So he was really supportive. <laughs> I, was, I was grateful. But yeah. honestly, it really hurt. I was like, yeah, that's tough. he doesn't want to work for me. So I realized I had to learn something else because my dad's style, everyone respects him and listens to him. He doesn't have to wear ugly suits or shout, but people will listen to him because he's a man, because he's established, he's older, he knows what he's doing, he knows what he's saying. So he had a friend who was a woman who worked in real estate and he asked her to start to mentor me. Mm. So she moved her whole office into our office and I got to sit next to her every day and learn from her. And she had been dealing with like sites for years. And honestly, construction for women is just a nightmare of a yeah. world. But she had specific things she would do, the way she would dress, the way she would speak to people, the way she'd plan, the way she'd get things done. And I learned so much just by being around her physically, not even like the most technical things which I had done in the business, but that experience completely changed how I realized I have to learn. Yeah. So since then, I always make sure I have a female mentor in the sector that I need to be learning from and working with because they just have a different experience. And you can ask them, like, can I wear those shoes? Are we going to like a site? Or is it like a heels? Or is it like a this? Like, there are so many things men don't have to think about that we have to consider. True. And I can't ask a man that. How did you plan for this? Did you have to think about this? What about your safety? For what some, about some your some outfit? It's just like the automatics for them, right? Yeah. So it helps to have women who teach you these things. Yeah. And are you a woman who teaches others these Oh things? my gosh. I love to share it. Even if you don't ask, I'm ready to tell you. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in closing, I just want to know from you, if you just look at the camera over there, uh, what you see the future of social entrepreneurship in Africa, especially when it comes to empowering women and really, like, how would your final words and inspiring young women, young men, youth in Africa, really, um, and women in Africa, um, women in leadership, your final words? <laughs> Make it good. Oh no my pressure. God, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think social entrepreneurship will have a bigger role in Africa for two reasons. One, because we do need it more and because we've seen the benefits of it. Because... We, as young Africans, we are also entitled to everything on the beneficial side that the West has had. We are entitled to internet, to electricity, to entertainment, to all the good and bad things. We should also be allowed to drive SUVs and have washing machines and energy guzzling things. But we have to do it in a smarter way. We do have climate change. That is something that we are all aware of and is affecting us 
at horrific rates because our countries are just not prepared from an infrastructure point of view. So it's something that we have to like hold more dear to us. But also because there's so many benefits. I think as an African society, as young people in Africa, if we learn from day one, business is social business. Business has to, you have to take into the social aspect, the environmental aspect, as well as the economic aspects. If we just teach that to kids from day one, that's the world they will know. And that's the world they'll build. So there's so much more potential. We don't have to make the same mistakes. We can learn faster. We can do things in our own way. We can innovate and build these cultures where all businesses in Africa really are social businesses. And they really are tracking these things and being proactive and being intentional about who they hire and how they treat them and what suppliers use and what chemicals we're putting in our bodies. There are so many things we can do that we don't have to learn the hard way. Yeah. And I think that's an advantage we have by developing at this stage because when you think about industrialization and things that happen in Asia or Europe, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have the benefits that we have today. They didn't have the studies. They didn't have the educators, the teachers, the coaches, the mentors, and the resources that we have access to now. So we can do a better job. And I think we are very capable of doing that. And it's part of our responsibility for our continent to do that. Beautiful. And now, officially in closing, we have a section. We call it the one word section. Ooh. We'll probably think of something better. Um, but it's in collaboration with a women-led company called Sunrise Gems. They are in the diamond industry. And so we will be gifting you, courtesy of Sunrise Gems, a diamond piece with a particular word. Oh, wow. <laughs> and this word will be coming from you. So what word Ooh. would you use to define maybe either the, the life you're living now or where you see Africa going? Depends. It'll be your piece anyway. So it's just for me, but really it should be <laughs> my dedication to Africa and the belief that I have yeah. in all our youth. Mm. You'd think it'd be easy, hey? Just thinking of a word. I know. I don't want it to be too easy. You like their diamonds. <laughs> Optimism. Optimism. Yeah. It's different from hope. Yeah. Hope has a little, it's a bit too woo-woo right now. Optimism comes with Optimism. action. Optimism, yeah. yeah. Action, facts, data. We like it. I have I have real optimism. I believe. I believe. Optimism. optimism. All right. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Natalie Bichature. Got it. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next time. Connect with me on all social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Bani Medisa.